good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, I'm, it's really a pleasure to be here. Let me first thank the Copernicus Festival organization for inviting me. I'm really happy to, to be here. My name is Valentina Presutti. You already know that. I'm a computer scientist, a professor in Bologna. And I have the honor to coordinate um, a project, uh, a research project funded by the European Commission about uh, the European musical heritage. And I will show you some of our results so far. The project started uh, one and a half year ago. We are all more or less in the middle of the process. Uh, and I will showcase a prototype application, actually two prototypes, uh, that demonstrates one, a few of the many possible things that, that we can do with the data that we are producing uh, through AI technologies. Um, before we start, let me invite you, if you like, if you want, to comment on this presentation and discuss on Twitter. You can use the uh, hashtag PolyphonyH2020. And let's go. So I would like to start uh, by telling you a story. Um, in the late 17th century, the Dutch uh, Republic uh, and the French Kingdom, they were at war. And as we know, uh, or at least as we expect, wars raise barriers in many senses, like uh, economical, political, cultural barriers. Unfortunately, we are living now in a period where we have a very close war and, uh, war and we, we are witnessing what's going on in this sense. Um, but there is a late professor uh, uh, at Utrecht University, Louis Schreib, um, he's also, he was also a researcher uh, in musicology of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Art and Science and he has found evidences uh, that traditional Dutch music from the late 17th century, so the period where the war was running, was influenced by French opera of the same period. So he demonstrated that uh, Dutch text songs so, so traditional songs with lyrics, they were often the result of a, a lively exchange with neighborhood countries. This is surprising, especially if we think about the French-Dutch connection influence, because they were at war, so you wouldn't expect this kind of exchange. So what you're listening to is uh, um, an opera, a composition by Jean-Baptiste Lully named Belle Iris. Uh, is one of the examples of the many examples of French tunes that has been matched to some Dutch song, some D Dutch uh, tune. What we, you will hear now... is the Dutch... is a Dutch traditional song. I think we all can understand and recognize that the tune is the same. The, the sound is different, maybe the way they play it, but the, the melody, the tune is really the same. And another difference is that it has lyrics. It's actually a song that talks about someone rescued from a shipwreck. And, uh, and basically the, the, the point is that, that also Professor Schreib um, uh, found evidence about is that they would use, reuse tunes from the French opera, for example, and then write lyrics and use the tunes and, uh, with the lyrics wrote in Dutch. So this is just one of many examples that he found. And uh, clearly studies like this uh, raise other questions. For example, how many influences or similarity like this one uh, are hidden in the European music and which ones? And do they develop in similar political context or cultural context? Uh, does music transcend political and social controversies? So it's easy to imagine how much European musical heritage could be revealed uh, by conducting a large-scale study, cross-analysis on many, many sources. So, um, in, for example, there are lots of uh, documents, tunes, recordings, scores, and different type of material that are in different distributed collections around Europe. 
but also literatures, for example, that tell story about the European, um, the European uh, musical heritage, for example, letters or uh, uh, critics about uh, uh, performances and things like that. But these studies uh, demand enormous resources. So how many tunes, uh, catalogues or articles can a scholar, a musicologist analyze even in a uh, whole lifetime, okay, manually? I mean, it takes a lot of effort, right? So I asked my colleague in the consortium of Polyphonia um, how their research process works. And they told me that basically what they do is that they, they do have a tune in mind, um, maybe a Dutch traditional song, so they search for it into some collection. Uh, and then when they find, they, they recover, they retrieve material, uh, they analyze it, and then they discuss it and draw some conclusion. And this takes on average like half an hour for a tune. But notice that I'm talking about a tune that they have in mind, a collection, one collection maybe, maybe two, that they know very well how to query, because when you change the source, each source at has its own way of representing the, the information, right? Um, and also, they, don't really can sh they, they cannot really search for something they don't know in advance, okay? like discover things. Okay? And, uh, and if they go, imagine that uh, for, a, for a tune, you may have information that are really spread in many different and heterogeneous collections. Even if they had access to it, it would be an enormous amount of work to identify the material for the same tune, understand when they talk about the same thing, the same kind of information in different ways, integrate it, and then, only then, after a lot of manual f uh, effort, you can start analyzing it. So, <clears throat> wouldn't, uh, so we know that there is this tremendous amount of knowledge uh, distributed in different collections, hidden, let's say, in catalogues, text, literature, letters, tunes, scores, audios, and so on. So wouldn't it be fantastic if we could make this knowledge explicit and interconnected and available to everyone, like scholars, but not only students, artists, music nerds, producers, and so on, so that they can, you know, query only one source and get information about all this from this distributed network of sources, already interconnected and integrated. If we had such a huge interconnected, let's call it knowledge base, then, then yes, they could actually perform cross analysis on large scale. For example, finding evidence for their theories uh, from a large scale uh, source, a large scale data, or discovering things so that they could formulate new hypotheses, for example. So they wouldn't be limited to only the collection that they know, but they would get information from an enormous amount of knowledge. And actually, Polyphonia is about that. So we want to build such a knowledge base, global knowledge base about musical heritage. We want to integrate many, many different sources. We want to demonstrate uh, the methodology so that this can be uh, over time incremented and enriched and, uh, and uh, it, this project uh, is developed by an interdisciplinary consortium of 10 partners from all over Europe which bring, who bring uh, very different expertise from uh, artificial intelligence to musicology and uh, we are actually working to reveal hidden knowledge about musical heritage by using artificial intelligence, semantic web technologies, and data science, so that we can encode what, what we extract from these sources in an homogeneous format, which is called the knowledge graph. So let me tell you what a knowledge graph is. A knowledge graph is a data structure uh, where it's like a network, okay? A network where you have nodes connected through arcs. And the nodes, they represent things. So we can, in a knowledge graph, we can represent things because we can use a language which is logic-based so that computers, machines can understand it. So I can tell a machine that Tosca is an opera, not a word, it's an opera, so it has a type, it's an object of the world, 
and they can tell the machine that this uh, opera has some characteristics, such as a composer, um, a, a name, of course, and, uh, and they can distinguish Tosca from another object which can be a representation of Tosca, a performance. So they are two different things, although they are related. And, uh, for example, the representation will have a venue, a date, which the opera doesn't have. Okay, the opera has a composer, a title, and uh, uh, the score, maybe. And, uh, and the same thing I can do for, with instruments. For example, I can have an object for bells, I can have an object for, for, for a person, Giacomo Puccini, and I can say this is a composer. But most importantly, um, these nodes in a knowledge graph are connected to each other with this... Uh, relations which tells what why they are connected so that opera as a composer which is Giacomo Puccini I can connect it to its representations I can say look it, it contains an aria uh, Vissi d'arte which maybe is uh, for example it can be connected to another tune because they have a similar harmonic structure for example so and so on and so forth so imagine all these things connected and get very very large um, and once I have this knowledge graph, I can query it. For example, I can be interested in querying about uh, who are the five most important uh, opera singers, uh, soprano singers of the 20th century, the ones who have collected uh, the highest number of performances in, the, in their career. And I can get this kind of information back from the knowledge graph. Okay, so we started building this knowledge graph, this polyphonia knowledge graph. And to produce it, however, is not trivial, okay? Uh, we want to relieve the musicologists, the producers, the artists of lots of manual effort, but still, I mean, there is a lot of work to do. Why? Because we need to, so as I said, all this knowledge is really in, uh, spread in many different sources, they have different formats, they have different uh, conceptual models for uh, representing them, so it means we need to analyze them, we need to model them, connect, understand when they talk about the same thing in different ways and uh, make them homogeneous, and then we need to transform them in this uh, formalism that I said before, that can be understood by machines, processed by machine in the same format. And uh, we started developing it and we have a first version of it. And I will show you an example on how it can be used. Um, so we selected initially three different uh, knowledge sources. They cover uh, pop music, classical music and jazz music. Not all of it, of course. They have some uh, part of, anyway, they cover, the, let's say, these genres. They provide metadata about the artist, the performer, the places, the title, this kind of data about the, the compositions. And then we looked for other sources that would include, would contain data about the same tracks, but more about the content, for example, uh, their lyrics, uh, their chords annotations, the timing of beats, the key changes, and things like that. So we analyzed and processed all these sources, and then we transformed it and integrated the result into the polyphonia knowledge graph, using knowledge engineering and semantic web technologies. So, um, as I said, this was not trivial. Actually, this was a nightmare job. Uh, it takes a lot of effort, but it's worth it, because if we do this, so when you want to integrate a new source, of, of course you have to do this uh, kind of effort, but then think at how much time you, how much manual effort you relieve from, from the users, the, which are uh, professionals, scholars, and uh, uh, researchers. And they will, uh, will save all this time and will be able to focus on their analysis without having to do manually all this integration effort. But the mapping and integration job what, what was, was not enough for us, so we, we like challenges. So we said, okay, now we have all this data integrated, but we want to produce new knowledge starting from that. So we, we wanted to produce new relations, okay, because we want to give the, the, uh, the, the, the users of this data the possibility also to discover things, to have like uh, suggestions. So we took the lyrics of the, of the songs when they were available and we analyzed them. 
And uh, how did we do that? Well, we split the text of the lyrics uh, line by line, verse by verse. And then we used a method that is called text embedding. Um, to give you an intuition, what we did with a mathematical procedure, basically we, we mapped the text to a geometrical space. So each verse of a, of a song would correspond to a point in a geometrical space. Imagine to see this space with all points and each of, each of it is a, like a, a small fragment from a lyrics of a song. Once you have uh, these uh, lyrics in the geometrical space, you actually inherit the geometrical operations. So what we can do is to compute the distance between them. So we, we could uh, define what we call a similarity score between lyrics, which actually is a distance between them. So if they are very close, it means that they are similar. Or if they are exactly the same, they will be the same. If they are very far, from each other, they will be very different, right? So we did this study, both considering the whole lyrics and the, the, the segments. And we have encoded the results as relations in the knowledge graph, so we have enriched the knowledge graph. And we also put there the, the value of this similarity score, which goes from zero to one. Zero means they are different, one means they are exactly the same. So if you query the knowledge graph, you can know whether two songs have similar lyrics and to which extent, with which score. Again, not enough. Again, we wanted to add additional new knowledge, discover new knowledge. So we used, let's say, a similar approach for chords. So we wanted to also study the, similar, uh, the similarity of the harmonic structure of songs. Because we think it's important to give this information to musicologists or producers or artists. Of course, the machine cannot do the analysis. It can compute this kind of similarity scores and then the, uh, the expert will decide, will evaluate whether this makes sense. But if you have some suggestion by the machine, maybe you can identify possible interesting phenomena that you want, may want to study and evaluate. So we did similar things. So we normalized the chords to the same key and then we, we used something that is called n-grams. I mean, the technical details are not important, but in the end, to understand what we did, we did the same. So sequences of chords uh, were, you know, transformed into points in this geometrical space. And we did the same. So are they close? Uh, there we also encoded how many times this sequence would repeat in a song, so you can see how much really, you know, they, they are similar. Um, okay, so we added harmonic similarity scores again from zero to one, and the lyric similarity, and we have also many, others, many other information in the knowledge graph about the places, the authors, uh, the title and uh, things like that. Okay, I want to show you now one of two demos. So this one is the harmonic similarity graph. So it's just about these relations that we extracted uh, about the similar harmonic structure between two songs. So what you see here is a graph that represents only the network of harmonic similarity. So all the other uh, relations are not here visualized. So each circle is a track, is a song. And uh, currently in this network there are 725 tracks and we extracted 75,000 harmonic similarity relations. Each node is a track, and when you see an arc connecting two nodes, it indicates that they are harmonically similar with a certain score. The darker the arc, you see that there are darker arcs and uh, uh, lighter ones, the darker the arc, the higher the score, so they are more, you know, more uh, similar. Um, the bigger the node, it means it has many, you know, the more the number of uh, relations uh, it has with other songs. So many other songs are similar, harmonically speaking. The colors of the node represent uh, the cluster they belong to, a cluster groups node that have densely, that are densely interconnected. So the color, the outline color on the node uh, indicates the genre, so the um, nodes with black outline is pop, 
uh, red is jazz and the yellow is uh, classical music. So by looking at the distribution of the nodes based on their color, we can already spot an interesting phenomenon. The jazz tracks are much, are much more spread uh, than pop and classical tracks. So they have less dense interconnections. So we could speculate, of course it's just a speculation, that jazz tracks are less similar um, than uh, pop and music tracks. We can also notice some special groups that form such as this one. So this is a set of densely interconnected tracks uh, with strong similarities, they are dark. If we, checked, if we check what they are, uh, we realize that they are different performances of the same Schubert composition. So that's why they are very similar harmonically, of course, although they are different performances. Interestingly, if we move the, uh, down a bit, there is an isolated track that connects to this special group with significant strength, which is Michelle by Beatles, by the Beatles. So it looks like Michelle, uh, so if you, if you see there, you can see that the similarity score is high and they have in common a certain chord progression, A diminished G, C minor, okay. So does this mean that Michelle was inspired by this uh, Schubert composition, or it may just be a coincidence that we can interestingly discover by serendipity through the observation of this graph. Um, then if we click on Michelle, for example, or any of the track, we can see its connections. And actually, by looking at the graph with this uh, feature, we can see that actually this, uh, uh, this uh, chord sequence is not very common. It's so, it's, it looks like it's a peculiar one. Finally, something you can do with this interactive tool is to play with the score. So I can tell the tool, look, I don't want to see all the arcs. Show me only the ones that are strong, for example, at least 0 0.5, okay? And so this is what I was doing while recording this uh, video. And you can see that while I raise this, increase the score, the weaker arcs, the lighter ones disappear. And again, if we look at what happens, uh, it looks like that our speculation from before uh, is supported also now because the jazz cluster, all the, most, if not all of, the, of, of them, of the arcs between the jazz clusters, they disappeared, while the pop music and classical music are very strongly related. Um, by the way, one remark I would like to make. So this is, a, this is a tool, it's a prototype, so it may change a lot in terms of how the interface will be developed. But the idea is that the musicology can have even a larger amount of data and with filters, it can look at this phenomena and try to isolate things that he or she wants to uh, analyze. Maybe they have an hypothesis, or maybe they just notice a formation like that and go and look and then formulate a new hypothesis and then go and study. Of course, they have to study then the, 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 the music and the scores with their expertise and manual. But let me remark that uh, actually musicologists studied the production of the Beatles in comparison with Schubert compositions because there was an, a strong hypothesis uh, 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 agreed among many musicologists that there were similarities. And uh, with, the, with the, a tool like that, it's not that they, you know, what they had to do is to study and analyze manually all the discography of the Beatles and all the production of Schubert and then make this comparison. So with this kind of interactive tool, they could uh, maybe look into uh, the ones that could provide more insights or at least, uh, let's say, have, have some evidence on the large scale without spending months in, uh, you know, uh, 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 reading and writing down notes on the whole discography. Then, of course, they would have to study it anyway. But uh, we, we, we really think, uh, and they're working with us, and you can see here there is another formation that it's probably very interesting. So these are the kind of things that you can spot just from the interface and maybe uh, then decide to study or formulate an hypothesis on, upon it. Okay, so this was about the similarity graph. Um, let me show now a prototype instead that wants to demonstrate one of the many usages that you can do, that can be done with the polyphonia knowledge graph 
we decided that it would be interesting and also very intuitive to implement something uh, in, in a player, in a music player. So like a music recommendation, music recommending agents. So um, I think that many of you here use a player, Spotify, Google Music, I don't know, any of them. Um, and if you did, you certainly have experienced also that they give you recommendations, like uh, based on the popularity of a song, or because somebody else uh, had listened to many of the songs that you have in your playlist, so they also listen to the other song, maybe you'd like it. So they give you recommendations based on characteristics that are, let's say, outside, external to the music. Okay? They, they don't really have to do with the, uh, with the intrinsic properties of the, of the music. So with the, with the knowledge graph such as polyphonias, what we can do is to allow the, 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 the user to uh, maybe have recommendations or search for music that uh, uh, have relations because they have some really real similarity between with the, with the music that uh, he or she likes. I'll, I'll show you now what I mean. And uh, <clears throat> uh, so what we decided to do is to implement a prototype. So it has, I mean, an interface like any player. It could be any player. Uh, what we did is that we developed three intelligent agents. Just as an example, you can develop many more. So what we, we thought about is that the player would give you a social network, okay? Like it does already. So you, have, you can follow artists, you can follow playlists from other users. So here you can also follow some artificial intelligent agent. Um, you can have one or more. And each of them has some expertise. And what they do is to basically give you information about the music you're listening. So the idea is that you can learn information, interesting facts about the music you like, or you can identify other songs that maybe you didn't know that have something in common with, the, with what you're listening to. And uh, so we implemented three, okay? And that we can, uh, you can follow them or unfollow. So the first one, is an agent exp that looks for, uh, analyzes uh, uh, tunes, to look for tunes having a similar harmonic structure with what you are listening to, okay? Based on the, on the thing that I showed you before. The lyrics agent does the same but with the lyrics. So it tells you, okay, look, there is this other song that has similar lyrics. And then we implemented another one just for example, uh, uh, which is based on place. The place agent will tell you whether there are places, relations with places in common between the music that you're listening to and other music. It could be they've been recorded in the same studio or other things. Um, so the idea is that you can search by place, lyrics or chord progressions, for example. Now this is not possible at the moment in the prototype, but it will be. Um, but what we instead implemented, and, and I'm going to demonstrate, is that you can receive from the agents that you're following a stream of uh, posts, like in Twitter, okay, that they tell you what they know about this song. So, um, yeah, okay, so imagine we have our queue empty, let's imagine we want to um, uh, fill our queue with, uh, you know, based on the information that the agents give me. So we start with one song, which is uh, Another One Bites the Dust by Queen. And let's see what happens. So as the song starts, you can see, wow, <laughs> you can see that uh, um, some messages uh, are visualized. These are the messages from the agents, okay? So now we have three. You see the lyric, the lyric uh, agent, the harmonic agent, the artists, um, the places, okay? And they tell something. Let's see the first one. The lyrics phrase, it, 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 the lyrics agent tells us that uh, another one bites the dust has this uh, verse, you took me for everything that I had, which is very similar to another uh, verse in another song which is, uh, tell me why by the Beatles. And the sentence is, well, I, give you, I gave you everything I had. You have the provenance of this information, so it gives you a list. There could be more than this. 
And you can decide, okay, look, I want to listen to this song and I can add it to, to the queue. I can, uh, of course, like it, like to store this information or I can share it. Uh, I mean, the usual uh, activities that you do in the social network. Okay, so now we add it to the queue. We, we go to the next, which will be Tell Me Why. And uh, you see a bar appearing so that we can keep the messages uh, related to another one by the dust separate from the ones uh, from, uh, about Tell Me Why. So these ones are uh, uh, from the previous song. And then again, I have uh, this stream of messages and I can select which one I'm interested in. Let's look at the place one. So it tells me that there are other songs. Uh, so first of all, it tells me where this song was recorded. So there is an information about the place related to Tell Me Why, which is it was recorded to Abbey Road Studio Studio 2. It gives me a map, it gives me the provenance. Then I have a, a list of related songs. For example, Come Together by the Beatles was recorded at the same studio. It's not surprising, we know that. But it could be different thing, like the same birthplace of the artist or whatever. Um, places that are mentioned in the song, for example. So we can uh, continue and add our, uh, in this case, Come Together. And okay, so we listen to it. So let's look at the third agent, the similarity, the harmonic similarity one. Um, in this case, the agent tells us that there are, uh, the, the, this song has a sequence of chords, A, D minor, A, which happens so that you can listen to at a certain time range, at a certain time during the song. It gives me, again, the provenance, always, of the data set where this information comes from. And then, interestingly enough, we have two songs similar harmonically, with a similar harmonic structure. Um, with the, it, it tells us, again, uh, the, the, of course, the title, but the similarity score, you can see, and also the sequence of chords that, uh, uh, that has been detected. And uh, here we have a jazz song, and I think also a classical uh, piece. So this one has, uh, in some part of the song, which is uh, anyway evidenced in the information, a similar harmonic structure as uh, Come Together by Beatles. And so you can go on and on. Uh, and of course you can do the other way around, search for songs with a certain harmonic structure or um, li certain lyrics, for example, talks about some specific topic or city or things like that. And here, for example, we have a classical piece from Schubert where, where the, the, the algorithm, the agent detected the similar uh, harmonic structure. Well, okay, clearly this was a teamwork, uh, and uh, so I, I think it's, um, they deserve to be mentioned. Uh, and uh, I wanted you to see the faces, they have nice faces as well, so it was nice to put them on a slide. We had experts working on the lyrics, similarity, Rocco Tripodi, we had the people working on the interface design, the ontology engineering, the transformation, uh, and the, the, the harmonic similarity. I mean, really lots of effort. And I can anticipate that actually we have continued this integration and now we have 18 uh, data sets integrated and it's a huge information, a really huge information. So this, is, this was really a, a, a very small piece of what we are going to release. In autumn there will be a, a release, so I invite you if you're interested to follow us uh, because we have already different tools already available, some demos, and certainly in, in autumn there will be a lot to play with also through our website uh, and web portal. So uh, I'll conclude by inviting you to, to, to follow us. Uh, you, if you think, uh, if you're an ex, you know, a musical professional or just a music lover, and you, you think you can, may, you can use in some way our tools and technologies and data, you may want to join our stakeholder network. You can do it through our website, it's very easy. And again, if you want to comment uh, on, on Twitter, you're very welcome. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.